I assume that this is the first time that you have ever engaged the thought of a seventh century epistemologist. Uh, I've read, I, no, I have read Greek philosophers, but it's certainly the first time I've uh, even been aware of this intellectual tradition. I mean, unlike many people at this conference, I'm not already engaged in this dialogue. Um, and I agreed to come because I thought it would be interesting, but it wasn't until I read the papers that I realized how deeply interesting this whole intellectual, to me, I mean, yeah. to my own concerns, this intellectual tradition is. Right. So what would you expect to come out of a further engagement? Well, uh, based on your first impressions right here. Well, I am, um, I have an interest in the psychology of religion, and I think I wouldn't have come to this conference if, if I didn't have that, that interest. Um, so, so I, I will be, as the, the sessions go forward, really trying to get some insight into what human beings why religion is a universal aspect of human experience in all cultures, mm -hmm. what uh, the quest for um, that, for a moral system and a spiritual quest psychologically really means. Mm -hmm. Basically, what Buddhists have to say about that question is something I want to, to learn because my work on that issue has always been so far from uh, Western religious um, uh, context. So that's a, a, my own personal interest. Um, uh, I, I was not aware that there was this epistemological tradition that you know has so much in common with modern cognitive science, and. You know, I, I, will, I would be mildly amused to continue that discussion, but I don't think that, w with the possible exception of what you can learn from meditative practices, I mean, what, what cognition is like from in, in meditative practices may actually inform the science in a new way, which I would be very, I'm always interested in anything that will inform the science in a new way, but I, d I doubt that I'll get you know, seeped in, in the, the debates between 7th century Buddhists and Hindus on these issues, just as I d wouldn't expect to really learn from the debates between Socrates and, you know, his contemporaries. Um, but, I, but I do expect to gain, at, at least in the rest of this conference, um, some really new insights about religious thought mm -hmm. um, over the example of Buddhist religious thought. So in the, you know, in the sections on um, experience and things like that will be, I think, and ethics will be extremely interesting to me professionally. Yes, um, uh, Professor Dreyfus mentioned that we don't really know what Dhammakirti's own meditative practices were. And although he at one point, when he's talking about the possibility of pure perception or pu pure sensation without an object, refers to a certain kind of meditation. You know, we don't know how to take that, that, um, that, that discourse. And so it will be very interesting to see whether there people have actually, people in the Buddhist tradition, people who really do participate in the meditative practices do talk about the phenomenology of it and what what that uh, means. Now, he, sa he said that we don't know that of Dhammakirti, mm -hmm. but I don't know, of course, because I don't know this literature at all, whether there is a rich literature on that. But suppose we would delimit this to Dhammakirti, right? Uh, would it make a difference to you if it were to be conclusively proven that Dharmakirti had no experience at all of what he was talking about, that it was sheer <laughs> theory? Well, yes. Um, I, I must say that the it it wouldn't make a difference. It does not make any diff much difference to most of what Dharmakirti is saying that 
the, the points he was making about meditative practice, because most of the points are what you come up with is you just start to think about how you solve the problem of how, how we are able to refer to things in the world. I mean, it's not an accident that what he came up with is very similar to what John Locke came up with. Mm -hmm. um, but he did make some points about uh, cognitionless experience mm -hmm. in meditation. Mm -hmm. And yes, I mean, I, I, I wondered what, how to take that even if he did have the experience, because since I haven't had that experience, I don't really know what he's talking about. Um, but if he didn't have the experience, then, then you know, all the more reason to doubt that he knew what he was talking about. So, I mean, I think, but I think that, that the way to answer that, of course, is we can never find out about him, mm -hmm. but we can find out about whether current um, meditators practice that particular kind of meditation and what they say about that experience. Uh, and I don't even know what, stand, what standing that would have as, as data for us as scientists, mm -hmm. because what we want, want to know what kind of access they have phenomenologically to, to what the actual mental processes mm -hmm. are. But maybe in conjunction with, with brain imaging or experimental methods, one could show that it's a different kind of mental representation. You do, you'd want to start with their phenomenological mm -hmm. um, accounts, right. but you wouldn't want to end there. No. <laughs>